Wait, 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 wait. Quick little intro before we start this. Have you ever seen those informative gaming shows like Game Theory, Did You Know Gaming, Boundary Break, Son of a Glitch, Low Poly, etc.? Just those YouTube shows created to inform the player more about the game, whether it be on helpful glitches, interesting lore that changes your perspective of the game, a uh, showcase of things you can't see without modding the games, and just things of that nature. I freaking love these! Like, when I'm bored and I have nothing to watch, I'll kick back and binge watch these. I just love being able to know and understand more about things like this, even if it's on games I've never played before. And I, uh, well, I want to be able to make one of these too! But like, everything I could possibly teach slash inform you guys about has pretty much already been covered, right? Uh, maybe? What do I possibly know and understand more about that hasn't been covered by a bigger platform or that not much people know about? What area and things like this do I specialize in that I can break down for others to understand to be entertained by? Nothing, right? <coughs> it's been nine months! Minecraft Console Edition, now known as Minecraft Legacy Edition, is quite a wonderful game. Even though its reputation has been oversaturated with hate and disgust because of the misconception that only little kids enjoy it, and because of certain people who have kind of pushed that agenda forward, and because of the fact that there's probably five Minecraft channels out there for every person that lives on Earth. Yeah, Minecraft's rep isn't too good right now. But looking past these things, it's actually a really good game, and Minecraft console expanded the community with letting people be able to experience this amazing concept of a game on their home console. The game even gets regular updates like Minecraft PC Edition, giving the console community something to always be hyped and talk about. We've pretty much gotten everything we've wanted slash needed, except for a few things. Things that we've been wanting and begging for since the very beginning. Custom Frickin' skins and texture packs. Custom. Emphasize the word custom. Flashback July 16, 2012, Forza Studios released the first ever skin pack in the form of DLC for Minecraft Xbox 360 Edition. It was the only existing skin pack aside from the default skins. Obviously, players were hyped AF, although I can't really speak for myself because I wasn't part of the community yet this time. Anywho, yeah. Hype. That's to be expected, right? I mean, players could finally change their skins to be something else besides unable to keep a job Steve's. This was a start for 4J. Skin packs started to continually be released based on themes and holidays and upcoming games and franchises and things like that. More skins equals more player customization and uniqueness. Yay! No. Yes, it was nice to finally have more uniqueness within players' appearances on Minecraft console. You can only have so many skins to choose from, though. And especially with most skin packs costing money, the uniqueness didn't feel too vast. Custom skins. Custom skins is what the community wanted and needed. 4J never really went at it though for obvious reasons. Money. Once players buy a Minecraft console, they have the game forever and get all the content updates for free. 4J needed some other way to make some more money off the game rather than the one-time purchase of it. Releasing and charging players for skin packs was the best way to go about this. 4J didn't exactly let their reasoning appear that way though. They constantly defended the lack of custom skins with the argument of copyright issues. Let's say a player on Xbox 360 was to have a Mario skin, or maybe a Spyro skin. Nintendo definitely wouldn't be happy seeing their IPs on Xbox, nor would Sony. I never really fully understood this though. Minecraft is a game about creativity. Anyone could just as easily make a pixel art of Mario as they would a skin. There's no issues with intellectual property on Minecraft Java, and hell, Minecraft Bedrock Edition, which is just about on every platform, allows for custom skins. We never exactly got what we wanted, custom skins, through 4J Studios at least. Fast forward September 4th, 2013, 4J Studios released the first of a new type of DLC, Mashup Packs. Pretty much like Minecraft Java resource packs, I believe, mashup packs changed the game's music, textures, came with skins, and a whole world all in one. The first release was the Mass Effect mashup pack, costing $3.99 in US dollars, just like all mashup packs did going forward. Because of how much was in the mashup pack, players didn't even start to get their hopes up for custom ones. Fast forward again, October 2nd, 2013, 4J released the first of another new type of DLC, not necessarily new to Minecraft, but new to Minecraft console edition, being texture packs. Nothing too extreme, just a DLC that changed the textures of the game. 
The situation that happened with the skins was the same for these. Players obviously wanted the ability to be able to create their own and use their own texture packs, but 4J sneakily continued their marketing plan, draining our wallets dollar by dollar by dollar by dollar by dollar. Bastards. I could continue on talking about how Bedrock Edition soon came out along with custom skins and such, but this breaches the topic of today's video being pack files. Pack. Like, without the A. Pack. It's really, really creative, 4J. Minecraft Bedrock Edition, although working with the same kind of data in the same way, doesn't deal with pack files. So, a pack file. What does this quick lesson I just gave you on the history of Minecraft console DLC have to do with pack files? Well, it actually has everything to do with it. Minecraft console DLC is a pack file. Some are structured differently depending on the type of DLC, but it's all at core, just pack files. Heck, even minigame DLC is stored in packs. Think of a pack file as an alternate version of a zip file, because really that's all it is. Multiple files and data compiled into one file. Originally though, pack files were only used for skin packs, which makes sense considering skin packs were the first DLC to ever be conceived. Packs store things like MCS files, being world data files like the tutorial, mashup, and minigame worlds. Packs store binkas, being music files and all that used in mashup packs. Packs store other packs of textures and images for mashup slash texture packs, and so much more. But most importantly, in this video I'm going to be focusing on how packs store and work with skin data. Because while packs just store those other files for the game to load, packs actually do a lot of interesting things with the skins. The skin structure within skins has actually changed a few times, so I'll break these down in the eras for you guys. BL and AL. Okay, so now we have a basic timeline here. I'll explain what BL and AL means later. But to be able to properly explain everything in a way you guys would best understand, I feel it would be best to explain how pack modding came to be in chronological order. Sometime around 2014, which is a guesstimated time considering Minecraft PS3 came out in the December of 2013, and there's not really any documentation of this, a PS3 modding group is known as Elite Modders became what is documented as the first people to modify Minecraft console DLC. <coughs> Packs. They didn't release individual packs though, instead they released modded PS3 backups with these packs pre-installed. I remember seeing Carnage Creator do a video showing these off, but I honestly didn't let myself think much of it. At the time I just assumed they'd eventually get banned, and I didn't care cause at the time I was more focused on modding that didn't involve modding the console itself. Later on, I came in contact with a certain individual, which I will not name for reasons, who gave me a backup and showed me how to install it. I wasn't aware of modded backups meant you could mod your games without modding your entire PS3, so I was pretty baffled by this. I still didn't understand how it worked though, considering all I had was a pre-made backup itself. After a lot of researching and getting in contact with the right people, I got a hold of some batch files that allowed for the modification of packs, as well as a tool that could write my own custom packs to a backup so I could install them on my PS3. It was extremely limited though. You couldn't add or remove skins from packs, and in replacing a skin, all its metadata had to remain exactly the same. And as if that wasn't limited enough, the skin's image dimensions had to be exactly the same, and the file size of the image you were replacing in had to be exactly the same or lower than the file you were replacing. I still work with it though, I mean, it was so much better than nothing. Later on, within the modding team I'm associated with, IPXD, all members got access to a secret version of MCC tool chest that the public didn't have access to, this secret version included many tools including a skin pack editor, which allowed us to fully mod skin packs. Now I say skin packs for a reason. It didn't work for any other pack structures, only skin packs. Using this as well as some of the other tools within the secret version of MCC tool chest, as well as the old batch files, I went on to create the first ever custom mashup pack on the Wii U being a Terraria mashup pack. This caught a lot of attention from different people on Twitter including Roger Carpenter himself, the executive producer of Minecraft Console Edition. He ended up following me on Twitter, <coughs> he still does, and talked to me in the DMs wanting me to stop development on things like this. Spoilers, uh, I didn't. The original structure of skin packs was pretty simple. It was just a compilation of each skin's image associated with some metadata that defined things like skin's display name, theme name, and a bull depicting whether it was free or not. Skin packs that had capes stored capes as their own image and linked them to skins by adding a cape path variable to a skin's metadata, linking it by file path. By what I can see, how skins used to work is, upon joining a world of online players, each player's console will retrieve every other skin player's skin data and temporarily store it as cache data locally within itself. You can imagine how this could sometimes lead to a lot of lag, like if players was to change their skin a lot, or if you didn't have a really stable internet connection. But because of this, having custom skins work online was as simple as replacing images within packs since other players' consoles online would retrieve your current skin data. I had a lot of fun using custom skins online on PS3 and Wii U for a while, and even created some fun stuff while I was at it. Custom skins was finally a thing for us modders. Well, 
until July 26, 2016, when 4 j released an update to all consoles, changing not only the structure of skin packs, but also how they worked online. All packs created prior to this update still worked fine, but only locally. Players online couldn't see the custom skin, only the skin that was originally there before it was replaced. This was the update that added the skin ID system. Ugh, frick, this caused me so much stress, man. Originally, we thought it was 4J's way of patching custom skins forever and kicking us modders in the face. But upon looking further into it, it was 4J's way of actually improving online gameplay. Remember earlier how I explained that each player's console online would retrieve each other player's skin data and temporarily store it as cache data? Well, 4J changed this. Each skin has a skin ID. A skin ID is an 8 digit number. How it worked now is upon joining an online game, instead of each player's console retrieving all external skin data and temporarily storing it as cache data, it instead retrieved each player's skin ID, and then using the skin ID located each player's skin data within itself. That means although we could still see our own modded skin, each player just saw the skin that was originally there because that's the data that existed on their console. This also meant all players who were using a skin that was modded on your console all appeared to have custom skins on your screen. It was quite weird really. This was also the update that enforced the new file being the lock file. Remember BL and AL? Before lock, after lock? Yeah, I'm pretty creative. AL marked the new era of the scan ID system, as well as some new metadata stuff added to packs, which was all stored within the lock file. The lock file is just a file that stores a bunch of strings. It's even used to store every bit of text you see in Minecraft, as like the entire game itself, but also to display individual DLCs string data. Skin IDs link a skin to a display name and theme name in the lock file. The lock file also displays data like the skin pack's name, mashup pack descriptions, and things like that. Keep in mind at this time, we weren't aware of the skin ID system or anything of that. We simply just thought 4J patched custom skins. But after many theorizing and testing, I got the first online custom skins to work for the AL era. How you may ask? Simple. Instead of replacing skin's skin images like we've been doing the whole time, I continued the skin ID index of the 8 digit number to a skin ID that didn't have any data linked to it. Upon going online, if a console finds a player with a skin ID that doesn't exist on their console, the player's console will do what it used to do and grab all the player's skin data and temporarily store it as cache data in itself. Upon getting this working again, I continued on with my fun of having custom skins. This did lead to some weird things though. Since the skin's data would be temporarily stored as cache data on the other player's console, if you went and made any changes to that skin, all players who have already seen you with that skin will only see the original skin they first saw since the skin ID is locating the stored data within their cache. It's kinda complex to explain. Egg. Anyways, custom skins are pretty cool, but something else that was interesting or that we never really figured out before, well, at the time, was custom skin models. Forge had some special skins in some of their skin packs that had fully custom models. We could see that these skins had this stored in their metadata as box variables. Each box variable is followed by a part, or I'd say a class, which linked the part to an individual body part, as well as 10 numbers. These are what made up the models. It was something we procrastinated figuring out for the longest time, until one day, I guess I just thought, screw it, let's figure this out. I remember getting home from school, I found a skin that didn't have much box variables in it. I set all the 10 numbers to zero. I then tested individually each number did until I came up with a whole mapping of it all. It literally took only an hour or two. I found that each box variable made up a cube within a skin's model. Using various box tags, you can make really complex skin model designs. Using my imagination and knowledge of what I discovered, I went on to create many cool custom models with nothing but my mind and compilations of 10 numbers. Be really cool if you think about it, heh. <laughs> Humble brag. It was around this time I found a public packet alert that was starting to be used around the Wii U community. It was known as Minecamp and was made by Jam1 Garner. This honestly scared me though, because no one was aware of the skin ID system but me and some people in IPXD. And with that, the uneducated modding community was pretty much going to screw over the whole MC community. I got in contact with Jam and found that his packet alert's source code was actually public. He explained to me how the classes of his code and everything worked, and using the source of my knowledge of pack data, I turned Minecraft into what is now known today as Pack Studio. To deal with the skin ID issue, I created a skin ID server system to properly generate and manage IDs and make sure that out of the thousands of people who use this program, none of the custom IDs generated would match. I added many visual tools like the skin adder, animation creator, and so much more, with my most favorite being the model generator I created using my knowledge of the model format. It's so nice to have a visual tool and not have to create custom models from imagination and all like I used to. It's been over a year since I started work on Pack Studio, and it really has made a big difference in the modding community. I'm so happy I was able to play such a big role in bringing to console what 4J never did. Remember the original team to mod packs? 
Eli Electronics. Yeah, they for some reason kind of just disappeared over a year ago. They played a big role in getting things started though, I guess. It's kind of weird how they're just gone now though. <laughs> Recently, Forge just changed the skins pack format a little more though. Master Packs used to store their skins in a skins folder of the main pack. Everything is exactly the same with how these skins would work compared to skins in actual skin packs, except these are stored in a skins folder. Well, now they're stored in a pack called skins.pack. We're still trying to figure out why 4J did this and how this makes any difference compared to how it used to work with it just being a skins folder. But in all reality, it's not really important. Because the old structure still works perfectly fine. Besides maybe being able to learn a little more from this, we already have everything we need for custom packs and DLC. This is really the bulk of it though. Packs. The Minecraft console version of a zip file. As of the time you're watching this video, I went ahead and released a major update for Pack Studio, adding many groundbreaking things that we've been needing for the longest time, including folder management, the ability to rearrange and organize data, um, a finalized model generator, and so much more. So be sure you update your Pack Studio. And if you haven't already, check out my tutorials on how to mod and create your own packs. As for future episodes of Decode Struct, I'm not too sure what I'm going to do. I love the concept of being able to visually explain how individual files within certain games work, but besides Pack, I don't really specialize with too much else. Future episodes might be done in collaborations with other big modders, I don't know. Only time will tell, but for now, I really hope you enjoyed this. This was a really big project of mine, and is actually my first scripted video. Freaking wow. Be sure to let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Constructive criticism is wanted. And with all that, I'll be catching you guys later. It's been your boy Jack, or Noble Des, and peace. Out. I'm out. Yeah. Bye.